You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. In these, in this realm, we're not talking about scientific proof, like you can subject a certain gas to a, a flame of a, you know, and and have it explode, and you know, in an early Meyer flask or something. This isn't science. In social science, I believe that the standard of proof that's being used in the truth community is basically the one that, you know, Margaret Mead used to investigate, you know, marital uh, pr- practices in in American Samoa. It's you know, I'm Margaret Mead. I have a PhD in anthropology. I went to Samoa, and this is what I found, and that this is what I think it means, and this is our understanding of the human race that we can draw from my testimony. That's, I think, the standard that we should apply is the social science standard, the standard of the university anthropologists and archaeologists and historians. Okay, now if you want to go into the beyond a reasonable doubt standard, I don't think, I don't think you're ever going to be satisfied. But again, if, if people are encouraged to only talk about what they know, to not prevaricate, to not embellish, to sell tickets. And by the way, one thing that David and Corey have done that's I think it's a mistake is – they, they're, they're basically tailgating. In other words, like when, when, they, when the, um, when the uh, uh, Antarctica story broke and we found out that Senator or Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, Barack, President Barack Obama, and Buzz Aldrin went down to the South Pole to see the, the, the ancient or extraterrestrial artifacts there. Immediately, David and Corey started claiming that they had gone down there. And in fact... Corey claimed that a spaceship showed up in his backyard yeah. to take him there. Yeah. He also claimed that he met with Gonzalez, uh, who some people have noted kind of mirrors my informant, Garcia, <laughs> the Ky- offered yeah. several years yeah. ago, that, that, that he met Garcia in the Kuiper Belt. Yeah. Well, I've interacted ex- my whole life with the U.S. Defense Department intelligence community, and a lot of my briefings have been in noisy Jewish delis in you know, Northridge, <laughs> California, and Santa Monica. Oh, boy. Know. <laughs> okay, so in reality, the guy sitting next to you at Starbucks may be talking to a college student who's being brought along as some kind of CIA operative, okay? Briefings are often done in noisy eateries, not in the Kuiper Belt, okay? So I'm just saying that when figures in the truth movement deserve to be listened to are embellishing and when they're especially trying to bandwagon and get involved in inserting themselves into breaking stories all the time, they begin to lose their focus and harm their credibility. And I must say that all things being equal, I think on in terms of the credentials that were cited, the background facts, and then this issue of going to Antarctica or meeting Gonzalez in the Kuiper Belt rather than in the Roy Ball building in Los Angeles or whatever, uh, I, I think that the beginning of some fragmentation of Corey's credibility has begun. But again, I don't want to stand in judgment of other experiencers because my own account is so hard to believe. But I do want to see an improvement in the way that evidence is used to scrutinize claimants because, quite frankly, I have I've spent 10 years defending myself against utterly libelous claims and just nonsense that has nothing to do with either my experiences or our evaluation of my claims. Well, let's. So let's so, uh, well, can, can I can I say something? Sure. Real quick. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, Andy, let me let me tell you. Uh, this is, let me tell you what I think about this. Okay. So, I, my problem with I have lots of problems with David Wilcock. I don't even want to start with that. My problem with Corey Good is sort of exactly what you said. Like right? he's taking people testimonies. In my opinion, he's taking them who I find to be more credible than him, just based on my own personal discernment and the way that all this stuff has come out and the way that uh, you, his story has evolved over time, whereas yours has remained remarkably uh, consistent. And he somehow, by telling the similar stories to the ones you have received ridicule, harassment, and all sorts of problems for, he has become a celebrity and gained a level of financial freedom that he never had before. And he, to the point where they're creating comic books about his stories, I have a problem with that as well. He, like, he, I mean, 
it is cartoonish what is happening. And he, you know, so to me, that that is the problem for me about Corey Good. It's not that there aren't aspects of his story or even parts of, you know, him that aren't, you know, fine and believable. But what has happened, it's almost like, you know, they have to do something to obfuscate the truths that you and others have put out. And so they take those and twist them into like a combined story here and then wrap that up with the blue avians and the spheres and all this other stuff and turn it into a cartoon or a comic book. And people, and he becomes the celebrity. They already have anyway. I mean, it has become a comic book. It's become a CGI fantasy. This was, again, I got to go back and and remind people, the (laughs) Facebook post that was the basis for Bill Ryan's relaunch, reboot of himself, had to do with the specific points that I sensed this had become very cult-like in what was being articulated through these blue avian beings. And secondly, that I saw the hypnotic trance states that were being induced by the use of CGI and color-coded graphics and even some of the, the, uh, the, the verbal cues, semiotics, and wordsmithing that was going on in the narrative that had been crafted. So can we can can I use this as a segue to describe yes how when they were how when they were creating synthetic experiencers, uh, academic gatekeepers, and synthetic activists were using different techniques yeah. to attack yeah. me this and to attack the truth. Point. Okay, yes, absolutely. Okay, let's yeah. just let's just let's just let's just uh, name a few more names with a little more brevity so we can get them all in, and I'll describe just what I know, which is how they treated me. Okay, Richard Dolan is obviously an authority in ufology, if not exopolitics. He's done a couple really great books for for one thing. Richard was present at the UFO Conference 1 in in, uh, Northern California, Santa Clara, in September of 20. um, And uh, Doug Dietrich was presenting his almost amazing um, explication of the Roswell incident as a Japanese blimp project from the war. And... I was I was getting ready. I was to set up to give my Mars visitation account, and Richard walked past me, and in a very snotty tone of voice, basically said, "Oh, sorry, Andy, I can't I can't see your presentation. I've got a I've got an interview, a radio interview from Denmark." I said, "Well, you, you should at some time, uh, Richard, because it's the truth, and you know this is your build." That's what I was kind of saying to him as he sort of walked quickly past me. Richard has never monitored one of my lectures. And yet, on a recent uh, episode of the Jimmy Church Show, he said one of the most discreditable or creditable stories in exopolitics is uh, Andy Basiasiaggio. I know that he knows the proper pronunciation of my surname, which is Bashago. I know that because I have friends who have communicated with him, and he's used my surname correctly. But when he does these radio interviews to discredit me, he manipulates the pronunciation of my surname, and he says – he basically caricatures my Mars account – as the Obama on Mars story. Well, it wasn't the Obama on Mars story. We decided to include Obama, and when I say we, I mean William Stillings and Bernard Mendez and I, because Obama was one of the jumpers, not because he was president. In fact, including the sitting president in our account was refractory to us being believed, right? Because Obama was the president when we were coming forward with our information. So that's actually um, something that supports the validity of our account, that rather than as a threat to the validity of our account. But, but, but Dolan has been spinning that to make it look like it's a threat to the validity of the account, but it's the opposite. Anyway, the bottom line here is he's making judgments about information that he has never analyzed. Again, he's allowing his beliefs to shape his findings rather than his findings to shape his beliefs, and he has libeled me in public, and I want him to know personally that if he keeps it up, he's going to see me in court. Because all, you, all I have to do is present my, my presentation in court, my two-and-a-half-hour, 150-slide PowerPoint, and it's not a presentation about Obama on Mars. In fact, Obama is identified as one of over 20 Americans that I cite in that presentation as participants in one way or the other with the CIA's Mars Jumper program. But now we have the problem of synthetic activists. How, how was this – Truth movement crafted where truth tellers were, were I, I mean, I had everything, I, 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 I endured everything from having Richard C. Hoagland, af- after I published my landmark paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars in 2008, Richard C. Hoagland, who then held the mantle of leadership in Marsology, okay, as a result of his appearances on Coast to Coast AM, his, his book about the, uh, um, you know, the dark side of, of, of NASA and so forth, the space program. 
instead of contacting me and congratulating me for my paper, which was I should add was the first paper to prove that Mars is inhabited and the first written work published on Earth to include photographic images of humanoids and life forms and, and a- animals, in other words, on another planet. Okay, Instead of sending me a telegram, and an email, a letter congratulating me for making an important contribution to our mutual field of Mars research, instead of uh, um, being magnanimous, Hoagland went beyond just saying nothing. He actually began to allege that I was not a real person. He engaged in total dehumanization. He alleged that I wasn't a real person. I was a CIA legend. And he began referring to me in a very peculiar way by writing my last name correctly, I might add, in down style without a capital B, in quotation marks, in hard parens. And he did it repeatedly, and he did it for over a year. Now, I'm sorry, but that is the the worst, the most rank form of character assassination is to literally try to murder somebody's soul by alleging that they're not even a person. I like to say that I know why Frederick Douglass insisted he was a man, notwithstanding the fact that he was a black man in, in a country that had perpetrated slavery, because I know what it's like to be a man who was a time traveler and have individuals like Richard Hoagland assert that I'm not even a human, that I don't even exist. Okay, so I, I, I've endured everything from that to the claim that was made by this snarky lunatic, Tory Smith, that somehow, while practicing law honorably and well in Washington for 20 years, without a single client complaint, I had found time to rape and kill, as he alleged, 111 children. That is 222 atrocities. Okay, in fact, I'm not only a God fearing person who's lived a Christic life. But I have never even committed a, a misdemeanor offense, much less a felony, much less an atrocity. So that's kind of the s- spectrum of utter crap that's been thrown at me to dehumanize me and libel me while they've elevated the false claimants. That's one of their principal techniques is to create false claimants and lie- lionize them and give them mainstream media play. Look at how when Randy Kramer came forward, he was invited to a soiree by Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the supposed truth adherent astronaut who once was quoted as saying, there have been several times that aliens have approached humans. Excuse me, come again? Okay. In any case, I have had the the most obnoxious, the most atrocious character assassination thrown at me. Well, how was this done? How could we have a situation where the truth has been disparaged and literally cockamamie science fiction stories are being elevated as real experience? Well, let's start with some of the synthetic activists in the field. This is where I take off the gloves. When I came forward with my Mars findings in 08, there were several times in which friends of mine reported back to me without me really asking them to do so, that they had been in conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer when he disparaged my Mars findings as irrelevant, as if the habitation of our own solar system isn't a principal issue, isn't a key issue in exopolitics. Hardly. In any case, he had been literally mocking me and condemning Alfred Weber for championing my findings. And this was from one of the principal publicists, as they're called, in in an entire field of, of, of ufology and exopolitics. In other words, a major scholar, a major activist. Well, I'd like to share with your audience the fact that when I was in training to go to Mars in summer of 1980 at the College of the Siskiyous, William Stillings, my fellow trainee and fellow jumper, ultimately, were walking through the campus eatery at College of the Siskiyous. There were five young men about five or six years older than us. I was 18. Brett was 13. But there were five American guys about 25 years of age sitting at one of the tables at College of the Siskiyous there in the campus eatery. And the individual on the end was introduced to us as Steve from the CIA. And that individual was a 25-year-old Stephen Greer. I don't even believe that he had his uh, his medical doctorate at that point. Now, there were some things said about Steve personally that I don't need to, to talk about. That's his personal information. Uh, just some aspects of his personal life that I don't need to broadcast. But we know it was Steve Greer. And in fact, William Stillings consulted with Greer. And he acknowledged that he had a career affiliation with the CIA. I'm referencing this not basically out of a sense of sour grapes about his disparagement of my work, which was actually groundbreaking. 
far more dispositive of proof of life beyond our planet than anything he's achieved. Uh, but the fact that William Stillings and Bernard Mendez and William Whitecar and I have revealed that we're CIA whistleblowers and critics. When we were going to Mars, we were going there for one of our unknown, unheralded space agencies, namely the Central Intelligence Agency. But Steve has positioned himself as as the um, you know the Martin Luther King of ufology, as the principal activist in this field <laughs> of exopolitics. And yet he has not revealed to the American people or his own public that he has this past affiliation with the CIA. Because what was going on at College of the Syracuse that summer is the people we were run, running into were enrolled in different CIA programs that related to outer Explain space. Explain what College of the Syracuse is just because most of us are not familiar with that. It, it's basically an obscure California community college that's situated on the, uh, on the volcanic apron of Mount Shasta. It's just a small, small little college, and and during that era, the early 80s, it was being used to give confidential aerospace briefings by the CIA. For example, another uh, whistleblower, I'm sorry to use the term, but another whistleblower who talks about being attending undergraduate training and being briefed and actually conceptualizing the International Space Program at College of the Siskiyous was the anonymous whistleblower who calls himself Millennium Twain. So there's really three separate groups that we know were enrolled in education at College of the Siskiyous in the early 80s. There's the Mars Jumpers, Bishago, Stillings, Mendez, Dugan, um, um, and, uh, well, let's see, Bishago, Stillings, Mendez, Obama, and uh, McCool. Um, and then there's the, there's the person who cre credits himself with being the progenitor of the International Space Station, namely whoever Millennium Twain is. And then there's Dr. Stephen Greer. What I'm saying here is if Steve Greer is going to overcome the rebuttable presumption of being a current CIA agent provocateur within ufology and exopolitics, he has to come clean with this point. I'm not alleging that he is because, look, after all, William Stillings and Bernard Mendez and William Whitecrow and I, we've evolved beyond what we did for the CIA and have become truth tellers. We are CIA critics. We are basically retaliating against CIA for screwing us and screwing the American people and the people of the world out of the truth. So I'm not saying that Steve Greer deserves to be con condemned because he attended some CIA training course related to ufology or exopolitics or outer space that summer at College of the Siskiyous. He must have, because William Stillings and I agree in our testimony. Well, that he is who we met, and that's what we learned. But he, he should be regarded as a CIA operative in the field until he reveals what he was studying there and comes clean. Let me insert at this point, because what you bring forward here in a first-person testimony is got a second witness in an interview that Emily and I did earlier this month with Elisa E., who is Elisa E., I'm sorry, who is an MK Ultra former... MK Ultra Project Monarch survivor who has gone through deep programming, who has gave us a narrative in that show about how she was programmed to Stephen Greer and how she approached Stephen Greer at um, a UFO conference in 2008. So we place Stephen Greer in the timeline a little further down the road now. Um, I don't know what the age difference is, but my point in all of this is, is and we've got a list here and we'll get through them because the next person okay. on the list as well ties into this. But I, I wanted to put that into the narrative. And then there's this other issue that sits on the sidelines, but it lurks there continuously. And that is the concept of the gatekeepers who have sat on top of ufology, exopolitics, the paranormal disclosure movement, MK Ultra, who have basically been able to contour the narrative on the fly as we've gone through, I will say, the last decade, because that's the period of time that I've actively been involved in what is called alternative media. So when we talk about Stephen Greer, we're talking about somebody who gave us the famous X conference, the, um, the breakout at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. 
when did you ufology become high profile enough to have a breakout session at the national press club and then to have the time well i mean yeah yeah well mm -hmm. go ahead good well if, if you if you examine the fact that steve greer basically seized the mantle of exopolitics at that mm -hmm. may 2001 press conference at the national press club and admirably at a time when he was thoroughly dehydrated from cancer and he did the, con the conference it had a huge positive impact and he fought cancer and we can admire him for 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 the manly courage and you know the the the, 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 the courage as a human being indeed for doing so I, I i don't like to to vilify people but he did so as somebody who didn't reveal that his roots in the field were initiated by the cia those who followed that conference and gleaned from it everything that it presented including all of that excellent testimony from people who had served inside the government who were revealing that that they know that we're not alone and that we've been in contact with et they also deserve to know that Steve's career began in some kind of CIA seminar at College of the Siskiyous when he was 25 years old and in a sense came to fruition 21 years later in that conference. And he's, he's held the mantle of leadership in exopolitics ever since because of that. So I'm, I'm not saying that Steve's a bad guy. I think he's a very nice guy. And I think that he's contributed a lot to the field. I'm saying that until he reveals that – that while, you know, long before he shaped the contours of the field in the way that he has, in the impactful way that he has, he was doing stuff for CIA. If he does not reveal that, again, it creates the rebuttable presumption that he remains an agent provocateur in the field. In the very way that his colleague Stephen Bassett, the founder of the X conference, was accusing me of being. I mean, since I entered the field 10 years ago, my friends, again, I had a lot of friends in the field before I became a public figure just for my own research and, and writing activities, for example. Uh, it's, it's, it's reached me that really for the last 10 years, Stephen Bassett has been all over exopolitics, accusing me uh, basically be, of being an agent provocateur employed by CIA sent to destroy exopolitics. Now, consider that assertion. I was the editor, Alfred Lambermont Weber's seminal treatise in exopolitics entitled Exopolitics. I, I authored an appendix to that mighty work in which I presented f the statements by 40 prominent world citizens establishing that we're being visited by off-worlders, by extraterrestrial beings. How would that in any way be destructive or detrimental to the major premises of exopolitics or ufology? In other words, Stephen Bassett began an immediate campaign of vilification of me right as I became a public figure. And I have to conclude, he either has profound problems of self-esteem that would cause him to a a attack an individual like myself who's lived an honorable and productive life, or he's some kind of operative himself. Because again, the stuff that's been thrown at me has been so constant and so deep and so unfair. You know, if we think back 30 years ago, think of the, the controversies that existed in in Paris science, like the, the lawsuit between Dr. Eldon Bird and the man Randy, James Randi, over whether Psy was real or not. Those fights of, of yesterday were almost collegial when we look at the character assassination and the vilification that's used today. Again, I have been accused of atrocities as an individual who still has a federal and a state law license and who has never even committed a misdemeanor offense, okay, think of the significance of that. That means that these gatekeepers and professional activists in the truth movement focusing on these critical issues of, of whether we are alone or not in the cosmos, of whether 9-11 was an inside job or not, of whether the president of the United States was born in the United States or Indonesia, Etc. Etc. Whether time travel was achieved f almost 50 years ago, which it was, these individuals are not abiding by any standard of fair play, and they are literally using dehumanization, rank vilification, and even false allegations of the commission of atrocities upon others. But what I'm what I'm utilizing here with Stephen Bass's treatment of me is just noting that his false allegation that I've been a CIA operative sent to destroy exopolitics, it began as soon as I began doing radio. It didn't seem connected to anything I had done, anything I had said, any conversation I had with him, 
It was as if he had been tasked to do it, and he was doing it in a thoroughgoing way. So again, just as I stated uh, you know, before, Steve, if you want to keep it up, I will see you in court, but stop lying about me. Michael Sala has already acknowledged that he believes me, and I'm working with him. Get with the program. Understand that I have my truth, and you do not have, a, you do not have license to lie about me. I have never been employed by the CIA. I was conscripted into two secret defense projects in which I was totally exploited, psychologically and physically injured, and not paid a thin dime. Okay? Well, actually, that's not true. I was paid a $55 check and a $34 check for going to Mars for the country. Okay? So this vilification has to stop. It's destroying the truth movement. Now, when you add to the fact that after 10 years of this, of this crap, 10 years of this character assassination, they're beginning to elevate and find movie deals and comic books and, and, uh, and shaping uh, events in the truth movement around people whose evidence discredits themselves. At this point, I have to throw down the gauntlet and say, well, I, I turned the other cheek for 10 years, but I'm not turning the cheek anymore. If any of these individuals continue to defame me, I will take them to court. I'm ready to get the pro bono representation. I won't even pay for it. There are plenty of lawyers who have already approached me. My good name has been totally besmirched by jackals in this field, and I have had enough of it, and I'm throwing down the gauntlet. You know, I thought that – I learned when I tried to fight back against the disparagement when I was doing my Mars research roughly between 2008 and 2013 that every time I fought back, I lost time in the day to discover more things on Mars, which at that time was my passion my intellectual passion. But, you know, so I turned the cheek for 10 years, and then what happened? Suddenly, you know, cheap, nonsensical allegations by somebody like Hoagland, I wasn't a real person, suddenly became the allegation by somebody like Tory Smith that, oh, he's a very real person, but he's raped and killed 111 children. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that by not defending myself over these 10 years, by being Christic, by turning the other cheek, by trying to inspire collegiality and fair play in the field, they have destroyed, in some cases, my opportunity to attract law clients. They have gotten bookings that I had at events or media appearances canceled. And they have prevented me from earning a living in a, in a, from a field and in a field that I've made major contributions to for over 10 years. Because after all, before I began talking about my experiences, I had to live them. And I gave eight years of uncompensated service to my country. So, so I just want everybody to know in the truth movement, I'm not going to be turning the cheek anymore. And you need to stop lying about me. Because every time you lie about me, you establish the, our major premise tonight is that some of you are government operatives sent to destroy this field in a very well-organized and calculated COINTELPRO infiltration of the truth movement. Well, I think that kind of makes the point we were going to earlier, which was, um, <clears throat> on one level, I appreciate your level, your level of collegiality towards people that, you know, could be viewed as peers. But on the other hand, uh, what I said earlier about gatekeepers essentially yeah. still holds true. That what sits over top of the entire truth movement, if we can even call it that at this point, yeah, are, right. people, are people who are in employ of high-level intelligence agency operations who have in the background effectively hidden the activities of advanced technology programs going back 60 to 70 years and the ancillary technology that spun off of that, which has in fact been weaponized against us, the people, while hiding the benefits, which would include free energy, the ability to travel f without friction, the ability to extend our lives through advanced medical technologies. When you begin to look at the, the scope of what's been suppressed and what's being controlled now, us talking about UFO conferences is actually small, but it leads us to a place where we can at least come to the conclusion this is this is a rigged game. Yeah. I don't find honor in this. I mean, to be quite honest, Andy, you could people could sit and argue all day about 
the minutia of details between one person's testimony and another, but the simple fact of the matter is that prima facie evidence here seems to indicate that, that they're running an operation in front of us and that people were paying good money to go and basically listen to fairy right. tales. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> I'm not actually willing to be as nice as you've been at this point, although I think, I think all of us are sufficiently pissed off about it at this point to, as you said, take the gloves off. Did we lose him? You there, Andy? I think we lost him. Ah, that's interesting. Okay, hold on. Let me. No, I'm, 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 okay. I'm here. I had, I, oh, okay. I had a tr transmission block. I'm, I'm back. Okay. Uh, okay. Let, let me, let me use what you just said. A very eloquent point you made to, uh, as a segue now. Actually, to nothing discuss. that I just said was all that eloquent. It was really pretty much raw expression of, I think, the well, state of the situation, but go ahead, please. Fair, fair, enough, fair enough, fair enough. But let, let me just discuss some other major figures in the field, and I will describe how they've treated me, and I will allow others to draw the conclusion of whether or not they are, are, are basically participants in the subversion of the truth movement as gatekeepers in the way that you just alleged has been occurring. Major Ed Dames has spent 30 years appearing on major radio fora, to talk about things like just I'll just cite one of them, the kill shot from the sun, which after all is an irrelevant issue because if we're going to be hit by a kill shot from the sun, we're all going to be charcoal, right? And damn it's, thing you, know, you can do about that. Not a damn thing you can do no. about the earth being struck by a solar flare, except decide whether you want to be incinerated immediately or or drown later. Okay, so in a, in a hellacious storm. So um, now I know Major Ed Dames in a different context. He worked with me in the Montauk. Ch when my dad and I jumped from 1971 to 73, and he was our instructor at College of the Siskiyous for the Mars Jumpers. I appeared on Coast to Coast AM in 11, 10, 11, and Tom Danheiser, their producer there, brought Ed Dames on to kind of ambush me to assert that he wasn't our, our training officer. He has now been starting his lectures, talk about high-end expensive lectures, you know, his $350 lectures in Las Vegas his weekend seminars, stating I never went to Mars. And yet his participation as training officer has been affirmed not just by myself, but William Stillings, Bernard Mendez, and William Whitecrow, who wasn't in our class, but was aware of Ed's participation. Okay, so on one level you have, you have gatekeepers from the military who can't become true truth tellers because if they were to come forward as we have, they would either be prosecuted under JANEP 146E, which puts them at risk at 10 years of imprisonment in Leavenworth, a $10,000 fine, and loss of their entire military pension, or either shutting up or prevaricating with false data. I believe that Ed has chosen the latter, and that, as was evinced in his behavior when I appeared and alleged that he was our Mars training officer, he basically went into a white-hot panic on that broadcast when we were revealing that he was our Mars training officer. In fact, his mic had to be cut off because he had begun swearing. Uh, so you have a, a kind of a, a specific profile in Major Ed Dames, which is he's a major in the U.S. Army, and I'm sure that he wants his retirement benefits to not be, to not be to denied him. Then we have a prominent writer in the field, uh, Linda Moulton Howe. I reached out to Linda, I think, around 2009, and I wanted to brief her on the fact that when Richard Doty approached her 20 years earlier in 1989, he being uh, an Air Force intelligence officer, uh, I believe at the Kirtland Air Force Base right near Sandia where the jumper or the uh, teleporter back to the East Coast was located back in the early 70s. The, the, the data that Richard Doty was sharing with Linda Moulton Howe was data derived from Project Pegasus that he was then spinning and being caught in disinformation. So it was a very unusual form of disinformation, which he was sharing true data points, but then trying to ostensibly screw up and be caught disinforming her. When I wrote her to that effect, instead of communicating with me, again, collegiality, collegiality basic, basic networking and collegiality matters. Basic respect for others matters. Instead of communicating with me and saying, oh, that's very interesting. What, what more can you tell me? Linda did not communicate with me 
She had me investigated and paid somebody to investigate me and never communicated with me to this day. And yet I could have allowed her to have more material about what the whole Richard Doty incident was about, which was the attempt by somebody in Air Force intelligence to present memes from Project Pegasus through her and then spin it as true, but then get discredited to discredit her. So I was actually protecting Linda from being used as a disinformational foil, and she did nothing to, to, to t- take my lead. And so again, I have to ask, when she releases information in her reporting, is it information that she's developed or that she's instructed to release? Because she didn't want to go anywhere with my data, and in fact made the investigation about me rather than all the data I could bring her regarding Project Pegasus. So, for example, the notion that the crucifixion was filmed was true. I saw that film in summer of 1972 at at Sandia, and Dodie was telling her that they had filmed the crucifixion, or the ETs had shown it to them. So that whole set of disclosures by Dodie to to Moulton Howe were data points from Project Pegasus. And I went, my God, this is an elaborate disinformation ploy. And Linda got got taken for a ride, but she didn't want to hear it. She didn't. She's never communicated with me. She's never sent me a single communication. And I know from the investigator that she had me investigated. I mentioned Hoagland with uh, asserting that I wasn't even a real person. Now we get to two of the really the major operators who, who, in my view, have already outed themselves. And that's Bill Ryan and and Kerry Cassidy of Project Camelot. Today, Ryan of Project Avalon and Kerry remains at Project Camelot. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything on on prescript here, uh, Randy and Emily, but um, I've had extensive interaction with these two over the years. And to believe that they're not government operatives sent on a COINTELPRO mission to destroy the truth movement would be to practice a form of insanity because I can describe how they've treated me over the years. And it's only consistent with a COINTELPRO attack on my truth telling. So would you like to hear when it began? I've got nothing to add to the narrative right now. I'm already on the record with this, so go ahead, and Okay, okay. okay. I, approached that, I approached both of them in 2007 about my time travel experiences. When I did, they believed me. They wanted to interview me. They included some of the statements I made, such as the prediction of a global coastal flooding event by 2013 in their so-called big picture analysis. I declined to do their show because in my interactions with them, I just felt on a on an instinctual, a visceral level that it was possible that Jeff Rentz's early analysis that they were doing a COINTELPRO operation modeled on a previous project, Camelot, that was a U.S. Army uh, counterintelligence program involving Bingo. things like yep. in- infiltrating a movement, gathering information about the leading activists, yep. reporting that information back to the government, spinning individuals' claims so the public would be confused about what they were disseminating, and then basically trying to destroy those individuals. Yes, I was concerned I about this in 2011. That's on a blog that's still live on the internet too. So uh, I corroborate that. Yes, I, I don't know how anyone right, can't see that. That's exactly what's happening. Yes. <laughs> Right. Well, my respect for Jeff Rance compelled me to hold back and not participate in their uh, their web their weblog thing. But when they offered the opportunity to do um, their pilot, and I I had them agree to a pretty extensive uh, non disclosure, non competition, confidentiality agreement, and um, the ability to, to 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 basically screen what they were going to say and, and comment and make it fair. I agreed, especially since it was it involved True TV. I would ultimately uh, do conspiracy theory with Jesse Ventura. I was eager as a, a, a major figure in the truth movement to establish a professional relationship with True TV, maybe even do my own TV show with them. I basically um, decided to, to go in with a very thorough agreement with them, but participate for free in filming uh, Shadow Operations for True TV, their pilot, the Project Camelot pilot in 2010, August of 2010. In fact, I was the first on-camera source that they interviewed. Now, previously, going back to 2007, they had heard my teleportation and time travel account. They believed me, and they stated publicly that they did. By 2010, even though there were many other controversial claimants being interviewed, among them individuals within this so-called Idlewild group of 
of disinformants, including uh, David Wilcock and Richard C. Hoagland, what has been alleged to be the, the COINTELPRO team that they're part of. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not because I don't have that data. But I certainly found that as the filming began, they began to focus on me as a foil in an attempt to discredit me. So, for example, as I was saying, even though there were many other um, controversial claimants doing on-camera stuff, basically being talking heads for this TV pilot, they emotionally pressured me during one of the days of shooting in Los Angeles and had me agree that the Beverly Hills psychiatrist Lillian Glass would evaluate my truthfulness. Was David Wilcox's truthfulness evaluated? No. Was Richard C. Hoagland's? No. Was anybody else's who was a talking head in the, in the show? No. They focused on me to, to focus on my veracity rather than on my data, which was a subjective approach. Everybody else was treated objectively. When I was being interviewed at 999 North Sepulveda, where back in the day the West Coast Jump Room to Mars was located, Carrie was badgering me so severely that I actually screwed up at what I was saying. And I said, well, that's not true. You just said, made me say something that's not true. And I stopped the filming and I asked them to recap that question. I know what badgering is because I'm a trial lawyer. I, it's my profession. Okay, I know what the evidential objections are as well. Her interview style was not fair. It was an attempt to get me to say something and then rebut myself because they had already filmed the encounter or soon filmed the encounter with this Beverly Hills psychiatrist. And by the way, many of these media appearing Beverly Hills shrinks are CIA people. They're CIA psych psychiatrists. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so then even though nothing had happened, nobody had ever discredited me. I had shared hundreds of facts about my time travel experiences. Hundreds of facts, my Mars visitation experiences 10 years later. I had brought three fellow teleportees forward, three fellow, three fellow jumpers and several other corroborating witnesses forward on, on Mars. By 2012, 2013, they were saying, we believe Andy on his time travel claims, but we believe that, that he's been given screen memories and that he never went to Mars and that he's basically lying about Mars, that he's a very disturbed person. Because he, he was, you know, subjected to MK Ultra in childhood, all this. But we do believe his time travel account. But we don't believe his Mars account. Now today they've rolled on to a fifth position vis a vis again, with no with no basic change in the evidence that they were originally presented with and that they're still presented with. And their position now is that Bill Ryan <coughs> Well, he did two things. One, when this snarky lunatic, who's supposedly now deceased, we can talk about these false deaths in the truth community, but when Tory Smith accused of raping and killing 111 kids, I sent, I called the two people in the truth movement <clears throat> who were creating a platform for those calumnious attacks against me, which were utter garbage, utter defamation. I called Alexandra Metters, of Galactic Connections. I reached her when she was at a restaurant with some of her girlfriends, mm -hmm. and she didn't even know who I was. I said, you don't know who I am. On your website, you're accusing me of 222 atrocities. You should know. You should know who I am. If you're going to allege or create a platform for somebody else to allege these atrocities against me. And I told her, look, I've lived a Christic life. I'm a very good person. I've helped a lot of people. I took care of my mother for six years as she battled cancer. Okay? I haven't lived even for the almighty dollar as a lawyer, I've been helping people for years, for decades, okay? I'm a good person. So I'm telling that to her, and she says, look, look, pal, I don't even know who you are. Okay, so then about an hour, two hours later, her chief of staff, whose name I don't have, her chief of staff called back and apologized and said, we'll, get, we'll, we'll take Tory's claims and his videos about you, his false claims about you right off of the site, namely Galactic Connections. As of six months ago, they were still up there, and only recently were they taken down. And in fact, after I had informed Alexandra Metters that Tory Smith was this sick, sick man who was making utterly false claims about people of a very vicious and vile nature, after he supposedly died last year, she went and did this maudlin one-hour eulogy for him yes. that, is, that is just a classic of insincerity and shallowness. I mean, I'm sorry. It was just pathetic. But anyway, she has a four, uh, that that and bear this in mind because I know you're going to get there. That is a replay of an earlier scenario that we're going to talk about yet. So just right, 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 that. right. I, I'm following you there. 
Now, I also wrote the other major figure in the truth movement or the counterculture, alternative media, whatever you want to call that we're part of. And that was Bill Ryan. And I wrote him an email. I said, Bill, I believe he's in Ecuador these days. I said, Bill, via email, I didn't even try to look for his phone number. I said, Bill, Tor Tori Smith has posted videos in your blog in which he makes the utterly false and scurrilous claim that I've raped and killed 111 children. This is true. I have never violated God's law or society's laws. Please take down these false and defamatory videos immediately. And what did Bill Ryan do? That great tr searcher of truth, uh, that, that great individual who first sponsored Corey Good and is now attacking him, he ignored my entreaties to take that villainous, vilifying content off of his Project Avalon, Avalon website. We now have him, the man who sponsored Corey Good, trying to prove to the world why Corey was never credible. So here we have one of their tactics, which is to, to build up claimants and then tear them down. I'm a true claimant. I don't know whether Corey is true or not, but he's definitely a claimant. What has Bill done with both of us? He's, he's professionally affiliated with us, learned our information, helped develop the presentation of our information to, 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 to the public, and then attacked us as liars or fantasists. So Bill Ryan's position now, after all these years, in his recent attack on Corey Good, he did a glancing blow at me in which he described me as the ideal uh, agent provocateur in this field in the sense that I believe my claims. Well, no, I'm actually an American who helped my country develop time travel and then went 40 or more times to another planet for it. I'm basically a former American astronaut. Just like other astronauts who have been attacked for decades by these liars in exopolitics. Did you know that the honorable American civilian astronaut, my friend Ken Johnston, has been attacked in the same vile and vilifying and non-factually related way by James Oberg since 1980? That's 37 years of vilification. I'm telling you, this COINTEL operation within the truth movement is not new. It is well-funded. It's been in existence for decades, and Bill Ryan and Kerry Cassidy are perfect examples of the kind of individuals who implement these government attacks on truth tellers. And I know that, Randy, you had a set of techniques that they use, so maybe I'll, I'll pass the talking stick to you and, and, and ask you to address the, um, the different techniques that, that Bill and Kerry have used to essentially ultimately defame um, claimants. In, in the truth movement. Well, effectively what they do is, I've, I've always seen them as a processing unit, uh, a means to bring people in, expose them. Kerry Cassidy's operative slogan is that everybody gets one opportunity to discredit themselves. What she doesn't tell you is that she does the discrediting and you twist in the wind. Uh, she uses intimidation, bullying tactics. Um, she subverts narratives. She inserts things into the narrative that uh, basically create cognitive dissonance. Both her, her and Bill are very good at playing good cop, bad cop in terms of uh, the way they would end when they interviewed together. She would be very aggressive. He would be very laid back. That's, that's classic passive aggressive techniques. And then, you know, just using semantics in ways that create reasonable suspension of belief and then inserting other facts that disrupt the normal thought processes that people would go through. In other words, on the surface, it seems very chaotic when you, and I've always thought that listening specifically to Kerry Cassidy is very chaotic, but actually there's a methodology to that in what she's doing. And this is actually psychological operations ongoing. It's, it's not because she's incapable of stringing a narrative together. It's actually the manner in which she operates. So that there's a disruptive pattern building rhythm that goes on. She builds a pattern, then she disrupts it, which collapses the original premise and then we build another one. So that in the, in, in the terms of how people view this, they never come to any conclusions. They're simply left with an array of factoids to grasp at. 
Well, well put. And I, I would like to yes. cite that in, in the 10 years they've been interacting with me, they have rolled their position. They have altered their position on me five times. So what is it? If they're reliable reporters, if they're not superimposing their jaundiced and inaccurate view on sources like me, what's happening? I haven't done or said anything different for them to go from, you know, believing my Project Pegasus account to now claiming I'm the perfect operative, I'm the ideal. That's the term he uses in his recent attack on Corey um, because I believe my information. I mean, that's just a total collapse of their own position on me. I mean, they, they shaped major film screen time in their Project Camelot pilot to let me tell my um, mm-hmm. my Mars story without interruption. She, of course, was badgering me, and I had to stop the interview. So, but I agree with you about the semiotics. There's also a measure of uh, specific attacks that seem to be couched as something else. And and you, 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 of course, had mentioned how they know that the means, you know, there's a there's a 12 minute news cycle, and that this kind of information is constantly yes. uh, constantly flowing through the internet. So they can basically not worry about what they said a year, five years, ten years ago, because their information about me is now completely contradictory in terms of what they had decided about me and my veracity and the quality of the information I was offering. They had basically ratified it as true. Now they're ratifying me as like the perfect MK Ultra victim, which is their nonsense. shelf life right now for information runs six to eighteen months, depending on how well they string it in in their own venues. And that's been my experience. Right. Well, what I, what I find preposterous about her work is somebody will say something that's utterly indefensible, and she doesn't challenge it. I have to ask, well, that's a technique of disinformation because if you allow in, if you create the false. Uh, binary uh, construct, you know, the binary um, communication event of, of a discussion between two people. And you ask a question that engenders an answer, and then somebody, somebody's ridiculous answer is not, is not responded to, it's not challenged. That answer actually becomes an assertion. And one that we found in her recent interview with the career senior British intelligence officer, Michael Shrimpton, was his allegation that one of our most honorable and uh, successful presidents, President Dwight David Eisenhower, Laura's great-grandfather, was a German DVD intelligence agent. I mean, that is a ridiculous assertion. And then when, when uh, just out of his own a- attempt to defend what he had just said, which was preposterous, Shrimpton said, well, he, he, he's a German-American. I mean, Eisenhower is a German surname. And I practically fell out of my chair laughing, you know. But did we see Kerry playing the role of an intelligent journalist and saying, what are, you, what are you suggesting, that President Eisenhower was part of this German D- DVD infiltration of the American intelligence established that followed Operation Paperclip? I'm sorry, sir, but that's preposterous. Instead, she let it hang. Now, I thought about that, where his answer then became an assertion, a declarative statement. Well, what what would be the value of of tarnishing the name and reputation of Dwight David Eisenhower now. How about the fact that a major figure in the truth movement and his great-granddaughter, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower, has blown the cover on the fact that President Eisenhower met multiple times with E.T.? In other words, that did have a purpose. It wasn't just to allow some, you know, senile British intelligence officer take a swipe at an American president in the manner of the uh, in, in the manner of the anti-American discourse that passes for news every day uh, in in British academia and media, it was more than that. It was obviously an anti-Eisenhower slur that had been engineered into the discussion. I actually listened to that interview three times, and that's what I concluded. So part of the semiotics of their style is, I believe, now they can ar- defend themselves and argue that this is not, not what they've done. I believe they create false interviews with operatives in which kinds of memes are disseminated. You know, um, Eisenhower bad, right? Eisenhower, you know, German spy. It's a ridiculous assertion. I mean, the leadership of Dwight David Eisenhower allowed this country to to be victorious with its other allied partners during World War II and 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 and, and reign over one of the most stable periods of American history when he was president, not reign, but rather govern. And um, and so I think that's another technique they're using in 
spinning the apparent process of investigating mysteries in parapolitics, the par- parascience, the paranormal. But actually, it's 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 a fabricated conversation in which the U.S. intelligence community is disparaging certain people because they have long-term propaganda goals in doing so, and that also explains their their very suspect rolling of their position on me low these 10 years. I mean, they've gone from publicly stating that, that I'm a, a great witness and they utterly believe me to now claiming that I'm the ideal government operative because I completely believe what I'm saying. And that's I can tell you that that's not the case. So uh, anyway, that's how I've been treated by Bill and Kerry, and I think that their public deserves to know that. Now, going forward here a little bit, you mentioned the Idlewild group, and since we're talking about Project Camelot, it's right. probably just important to note here that back in 2011, 2012, myself, Duncan O'Finian, and a blogger on the internet named Chris Neal were tracking the work of former White Hat and a group called, that called themselves the Idlewild Group. Former White Hat claimed Correct. that he was part of a group called the White Hats, which was a group that Kerry Cassidy was prominently involved with in, in a prior period that group apparently disbanded. What happened with former White Hat was the former White Hat then went on a very aggressive campaign of ridicule, intimidation, stalking um, of yes. prominent figures on the internet, uh, myself included, Duncan Affinian included, Dave Corso at the and, time. And, and, and myself. And yourself. And, Phil Corso Jr. Mm-hmm. Endorsed yep. by Ms. Cassidy. We went right. back, we proved the timelines. I documented this. These, this evidence still is on the internet. And, and isolated the fact that she specifically pointed people to this website when it only had two posts on it. That, that right. website rolled out for about a year. Right. At the end of 2012, it had heated up to the point where it was just a full-out war. Um, Chris Neal, whose website um, is still live, even though Chris is not, documented in excruciating detail the connection between Kerry Cassidy, Project Camelot, former White Hat, the Idlewild Group, and in the background I had a forensics computer professional, computer scientist who documented IP addresses that also documented specific activities related to let's just say financial remunerations that were being exchanged through these IP addresses. Now, this, this information is not releasable. It's not been vetted, so I can't claim it's true. But what I can say is that there was beyond a preponderance of, of evidence to connect Project Camelot, Idlewild Group, Michael Hemmingson, who was a host on Revolution Radio at the time, as was Kerry Cassidy, together in a plot to basically create a schism and ultimately collapse legitimate as- aspects of the truth movement. The result of that at the end of 2012 was that Chris Neal wound up tragically dead in circumstances that people who were close to him said this was definitely a hit. And as a result of that, several months later, Michael Hemmingson goes to Mexico and is suddenly declared dead in Mexico. Giant outpouring of grief from Revolution Radio, eulogies, blah, 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 blah. And the former White Hat blog, which White Hat and Hemmingson both disclaimed as being by Hemmingson, went silent. So, much like Tory Smith, and now Alexandra Meta. Meadow, Meadow, Matters. Matters, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. We have another interplay between media figures and then when there uh, looks like there's going to be liability, a key figure suddenly disappears, exit stage left. Right, and, and, and let me connect up the dots in a little tighter way and I'll try to apply the, 
needs to go on act. I'm a a trial lawyer because I've practiced in this area. But um, essentially, I I was I I, I was briefed by Duncan O'Finian. We had both appeared in Jesse Ventura's conspiracy theory on True TV. We both had real and bona fide backgrounds working for the U.S. Intel Community and Defense Department. So Duncan and I knew we were both for real based on different terms we were using. I don't want to say what those were. Um, he described the Idlewild Group, and again, this is hearsay. I don't know whether this was uh, completely true. I mean, it was what he was alleging at the time, so I'm presenting these as verbal acts, not as allegations. But he said this this group of um, sort of this disinformation racket inside the truth movement called the Idlewild Group from where they had originally first had a meeting in which they were tasked – to do this, this COINTELPRO operation in the field, consisted of Bill Ryan and Kerry Cassidy, Michael Hemison, who I might add was both a professional writer and somebody who had been stating on his Facebook site that he had been educated at the U.S. War College. Actually, it was the Air Force War College in Air Force. Air Force. Force. And he was was basically schooled in uh, chaos theory. I see. And... uh, and that it also included Richard Hoagland, his protege, David Wilcock, Sean David Morton, and then several of the super soldiers, James Casbolt and James Rank. Well, if we look at this, Bill and Carrie are now split up, and we've got Bill attacking Corey, who he launched as a, as a whistleblower. Michael Hemison supposedly died of a heart attack in Mexico, but like Max Spears in Poland and um, Tori Smith in Indiana – both of whom supposedly died as a result of this effusion or uh, emission of black goo, black which, is, which, which it, again, is, seems to be an apocryphal um, mode of, of dying. Um, so we have here a third person who was a, a possible operative who's mysteriously killed off where we have scant evidence that there was actually a death. Um, then we've got sort of that, that chain of claimants that goes from Hoagland to Wilcock to Good with Bill Ryan, another facilitator of the Corey Good story, now attacking that whistleblower. And we've got two of these individuals in prison. Sean David Morton has been convicted of federal securities violation and given a, essentially, effectively, a life sentence. And James Casbolt has been imprisoned in England for a year or two after trying to extort $2 million from his ex-wife's family and is now serving a 10-year sentence in, a, in an English prison. And of course, James Rank um, is still active in the field. I don't. I don't know if he was a participant. But anyway, that that's the group that that Duncan gave me as the Idleball group. And look what's happened. Chris Neal is dead, and that death has been documented. The deaths of Michael Hemison as essentially the white hat operative blog writer has not been convincingly established. Nor have, have the deaths of Tory Smith and um, Max Spears. And Max Spears with Tory Smith uh, defaming me as somebody who had committed atrocities that I wouldn't even think of committing. And then Max Spears claiming that he had jumped to Mars with Obama during the Mars Jump Room program. But but in fact, we checked Max's age and Max was about seven years old at that time and was too young because while they were jumping people in their early teens like William uh, Stillings, there were no child jumpers. So – Max, Max's allegation that he was a Mars jumper was either intentionally dishonest, he was, he was either prevaricating, or he was delusional that he had been as a result of my account of, of Obama being in the Mars jump room program. So um, <clears throat> I think that you really did a great service by, t- by connecting up the dots about the fact that Hemison was essentially, for my druthers, I mean, he was outed as – as the White House operative blog writer uh, and even had the professional credentials to be doing it. Let me just add that I, yeah. I interacted with Hemison in only one way, but it's a significant way because it shows the link between uh, the so-called Idlewild group and at least some of these people and government agents in the mainstream media and not the alternative media. So let me describe how we can connect up these dots. In this kind of ongoing Ramana Clef novel that Michael Hemison was writing in his um, blog, the White Hat Operative blog, he's, he mentioned me once. He said, if Obama's gay and Obama served and, and Barry served in the Mars Jump Room program with Andy, maybe Andy's gay. 
And in fact, that false allegation that I'm not heterosexual, in fact, I, I'm an avowed heterosexual um, and like, like women very much, um, uh, was made in a dishonest and manipulative way when I agreed to do the Colbert Report in 2010 or 11. This is all running together at this point. But you may remember that I, remember that. That I had an agreement with Jeff Cooperman, a producer for Stephen Colbert, to be interviewed – on camera with Stephen Colbert in a legitimate context about how our development as a country of teleportation could re- alleviate our reliance on Middle Eastern oil and hence our reliance on Middle Eastern wars to secure that oil supply. And I had understood that Stephen was very opposed to the war and I thought he wanted to do a legitimate interview. I, I was quite aware that that the Colbert Report was a comedy platform for Comedy Central, but uh, – Jeff Cooperman lied to me, and uh, they had no, they had no interest in doing a legitimate interview. They just gathered a lot of tape from me, took it at weird, kind of up my nose, kind of camera angles to make me look like a, uh, you know, you, you know, look unfavorable, just filmically in mm-hmm. in the way that the interview was filmed, and then they chopped it all up to do this farce that ultimately, at the end of the spot, as 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 groom and groom. Obama and I travel to Mars as a gay couple. Now, this is really not just libelous to say about a, a straight bachelor, but it's certainly uh, the grounds by which I'm going to give Stephen Colbert the fist sandwich that Buzz Aldrin saved for Bart Sabrell, because Stephen Colbert needs to know that if we are ever in the same room, I'm basically going to smack him. Because it was a completely dishonorable and... Um, vicious thing to do to promise an me ambush. Legitimate- they basically ambushed yeah. you yeah no, 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 we're not talking about some some blogger out in the blogosphere we're talking about the one of the leading comedy shows That's and right. political commentary shows well, one of the on leading television. figures on television today look at the position he sits in now yes he's now what and he was groomed for that i mean this is all right you know right right so they need to know that when you when you do not honor and you publicize lies and character assassination against an American astronaut and, and national hero such as myself, you're not doing something neutral. So Stephen Colbert needs to know that. I will accept an apology, however, because I believe in human uh, redemption of people's behavior. But that's what happened. Stephen Colbert is one of these disinformationists in the mainstream media, and his attack on me, by his, his operations attack on me, directly mirrored the attack on me by Michael Hemison. What are the chances? Um, so um, anyway, I just wanted to share that that was my interaction with Michael Hemison. I did have a few emails back and forth with Max Spears. I, I don't see, think I even responded to uh, Tory Smith because um, I just considered him a lunatic, but it, clearly he was part of this group. But I just want to say, isn't it interesting at a semiotic level? In the pre-interview, you were talking about their wordsmithing, so I wanted to tr- address that. But look at how the name Tory Smith anagrammatically becomes the name Story Myth. Look at how my time travel memoir is the long-awaited Once Upon a Time in the Time Stream, which has three eyes in it and involves uh, the memoir of somebody who served in the development of time travel as a child, and he was accusing me of raping and killing 111 children, three eyes. Mm-hmm. That's their use of semiotics to, to sow disinformation. But the others that we talked about, isn't it a little bit passing strange that, or indeed more than passing strange, that when the next Mars whistleblower stepped forward after Andy did, that Randy did? I mean, we were talking about the fact that there are only – there are only two other male names in the West that rhyme with Andy, and they're basically Randy and Sandy. Mm-hmm. What are the chances that the next made whistleblower, who would not only um, come along to one-up my account, but he would do so with a similar name? He would be feted by astronaut Edgar Mitchell, even though before he had even really appeared on any major media platforms. I mean, I arrived in 10 years of hard work. But it seems like this other class of, um, of operatives in this field, which are the synthetic experiencers, that's one of the, the signs that they're a synthetic experiencer is they're lauded by these gatekeepers exactly. immediately. Exactly, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's Randy almost like like let's strike up the orchestra and break out Jacques Brel's song "Send in the Clowns" done by Judy Collins because that's effectively what they've done. Or "Send in the Clones." <laughs> I mean, even better. Yeah. Send in the clones. Send, send in the clones. And that was my point that I was trying to make before. Is, 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 it was exactly that what you guys just said. So that you know that to me that's how you tell that there's something wrong with someone's story is if they so they get applauded for something that somebody else was ridiculed for. It's a fair right, amount exactly. of encoding exactly. in all of this, Andy. And another one you pointed out um, had to do with, um, sorry, I, I lost my place in the notes. That was Well, awesome. I thought yeah. you mean. Uh, but I, I, well, I, I, William I, White Crow. What have oh, we right, seen? Right. Okay, so in just the last right. couple days, just we'll insert this. We had a shooting incident down in Houston, Texas that right. involved Duncan and Finian. The assailant right. in that case is a man who goes by the name of William White Feather. No, actually, it's William Two Feathers. Two Feathers, that's it. But right. I would note that two has a W and an O in it. Yeah, that's it. And, and, and so less than a year after, William White Crow came forward. In multi, this, is what, this is amazing. This just shows how I'm starting to basically win convincingly and on the merits and establishing the truth of what I've been alleging these, these 10 or 15 years. I bring White Crow forward in multiple media venues. He publicly states that, yes, he was my martial arts instructor in 1971, 72, when I was in the fifth grade, when Andy was time traveling for ARPA. That was his statement. That, yes, when he was an Army guard on Mars, we met up again in the mid-1980s or early to mid-1980s and then endorsed me for president of the United States. OK, so so less than a year after William White Crow makes that statement as the charismatic human being that he is. Because, I mean, you know, you got to admit that William White Crow has star charisma, okay? He is a remarkable human being in the manner of a Jesse Ventura, right? Less than a year later, the person who's holding all of the facts about this network of COINTELPRO people who have infiltrated uh, the truth movement is shot at six times with four of the bullets striking him by a deranged Native American named William Two Feathers. Yeah. What are the chances? How many William with Native American surnames are there in the whole country? <laughs> well, we <laughs> How many just... know anybody in the truth movement? We don't know, know but oh. what, what I can tell you that from my position, I watched the alternative media start to turn on a machine on the story. And James Rink was the rink master in all of this. Isn't that interesting, James? You're, right. you're a rink Do master. Don't, don't, you, don't you wish with all this wordplay we also had Zachary Hubbard here to do the gematria of all these names and exactly. words? Exactly, yeah. So I, listen, a year ago, almost within the next couple of weeks, I don't remember the exact date, the, the, the Max Spears thing rolled out. I can tell you, I observed this from a standpoint of almost hour by hour at some points because by the time Max Spears' death was announced, it was literally announced to me on a Skype call with a with a talk show host named Terry Joyce, who I was on Skype with when Max Spears' death was announced, um, the drama that played out on that with Kerry Cassidy and um, Miles Johnston uh, assembling a hastily thrown together radio show which had no substance, nothing to offer, and was pure conjecture was designed to place them in a position at that point as information brokers on a story that was being assembled in process, much like the narrative that news do with false flag events, by the way. So in, in the process of the Max Spears things, the most bizarre things were spun out of that story. I mean, the story was strange beyond anything I, I think I've ever witnessed in a, in a, in a media venue. We saw this begin again when word leaked out that Duncan had been shot. Oddly right. enough, Suddenly, you know, oddly enough, I was supposed to be doing an interview with Duncan at the time he was shot. I was literally texting him back and forth before his phone took the bullet. So if anybody was close to the story, it was me. So there is a huge amount of energy that flows through this medium. And people need to recognize it is an electronic medium. It is a medium of mind control. It was a medium that was bequeathed to us by the military-industrial complex and that 
Everything that has to do with plasma screens and CPUs and high frequency signals and Wi-Fi's also has to do with hypnotic trance and mind control and the things that flow through even the text on your screen. Right, and, and, and in that cavalcade, that kind of uh, constant streaming of meme manipulation, one of the things they've, we, we just mentioned it, but let me kind of elaborate on it. It's the, the creation and the promotion of synthetic experiencers. We've kind of touched on this already, possibly with Corey Good and Randy we did. Kramer. We did, yes. That's but point. we could also just, yeah, we could discuss what I call the Flash Gordons. The Flash Gordons are the ones that are involved in sort of a constant game of one-upsmanship regarding their space-related personal exploits. I think that this typology in this ongoing co COINTELPRO manipulation of the truth movement began at least recently, you know, modern times, with Aaron McCollum. You may recall that Aaron burst on the scene about five or six years ago, and he talked about not just going off planet, like the Mars jumpers were starting to talk about, but out of the solar system. And he was not just a jumper, but an assassin for the U.S. government, such as the Duncan Elfinians have talked about. And then finally, to top it off, he was not just human, but part dolphin. And as I began to listen to these narratives, I realized that the the, the chief thrust of the synthetic experiencer is to one-up those who give the true account of their relatively mundane experiences doing extraordinary things. I, I've often said in my interviews that, yeah, going to Mars was kind of like being in a, a war of the military because it was long periods of boredom punctuated by small moments of absolute terror, like when we were under attack by a predator on the surface. So we found this Aaron McCollum typology. Aaron has disappeared from the scene, is alleged to be living in a very expensive home on Tampa Bay in Florida. I don't know, but that's been stated to me. Uh, Max Spears, who you've mentioned, whose death by black goo was in itself a kind of a, uh, a hyperventilated assertion, a kind of a form of one-upsmanship even in his death. He was, he was alleging that he was a Mars jumper when he was a child, which was, a, again, a, a kind of a... Uh, a form of one-upsmanship, and he was also trying to make it out that he was one of the first or perhaps the only super soldier who had gone into space. So again, the emphasis was not just on describing his experiences, but engaging in this kind of um, one-upsmanship of previous true claimants to kind of diminish the way that, they, that they're perceived by the public. Because again, even asserting that you've gone into space, that you've gone off planet without sitting aboard a NASA rocket uh, or the space shuttle is a heretical thing, a controversial thing to assert. I think clearly uh, somebody else in this Aaron McCollum typology would be Randy Kramer. What was, the, what was the, the first thing we saw from Randy when he was rolled out by Dr. Sala? And it continues to be emphasized as his story gets posted all over the internet that he spent 17 years on Mars. Well, let me address Randy. Why? Well, I, I, I think I can deconstruct Randy to establish that he's not a veritable claimant. First, there were no people who spent long periods of time on Mars and came home. There were two categories. There were the who were settlers who were there for life, who would never come back and talk about what they experienced. And then there were temporary visitors, many of them who were viewed as VIPs, like Obama and I. And in fact, White Crow has given testimony to that fact that there were specific people whose lives he was instructed to protect on the surface. <clears throat> the second thing that causes me to, to, to at least initially conclude that Randy is telling a contrived story is that he stated that he had hand-to-hand -hand combat with the insectivoid predator. And as, 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 as Brett Stillings can confirm my account, there were two inevitably lethal predators on Mars. One was a reptile, a dinosaur-like reptile that was about 16 feet tall, that had a head like a T-Rex, but a subtle body like, a, and fast body like a velociraptor. If you got anything anywhere near that thing, it was going to have you for lunch. And also this insectivoid that, that looked basically like an elaborate grasshopper that was about the size of a small garbage truck with a mouthful of teeth that looked like samurai swords. This thing was an utter killing machine. Okay, it was designed to kill <laughs> biological creatures. I'm not even sure ultimately whether it was an animal. It could have been a robot or something. 
So in alleging that he successfully defended himself from the insectivoid predator, in my view, Randy Kramer discounted himself. He discredited himself. But again, it's important to touch on, upon this typology because, um, you know, the Flash Gordons are sort of like the, the, you know, the, the first cousins of the super soldiers. The super soldiers began with an account in the late 90s by another person who's pris in prison today, or at least was jailed after he made his claims, Andy Perot. Yeah. And Andy Perot was alleging things like while serving as a super soldier, he had done things like jump out of airplanes without dying. So the super soldier mystique, which was then emulated by James Casbolt, who's in prison in England, and James Rink, who's on the scene again with the shooting of Duncan O'Finian, was essentially uh, pioneered by Andy Perot, who has dropped out of the scene. And we were talking in the pre-interview how there's a set of extremely discrediting things that have occurred in the truth movement among this very constellation of people. And two of the things you can do to yourself to discredit yourself in the eyes of others are to die under mysterious circumstances or be in prison. So those who have died, or again, maybe it's been falsely alleged that they've died so that as, as operatives, as personas, they can be killed off and stop, stop working in the program and go on and live their ordinary lives, have been um, Michael Hemison, Max Spears, and Tori Smith. That's a lot of death among a, a small constellation of people in the movement, especially without assassinations having occurred. But then we have the real death of Michael Neal and now the assassination attempt against Duncan. So I think, again, we're starting to see... Yeah, Chris Neal, sorry. Chris, Chris Neal, I'm sorry. Chris Neal. We're starting to... Yeah, Chris Neal. We're starting to see the... What did I say? It's okay. I, look, okay. I, it's getting yeah. late. We're, yeah. we're, we've been yeah. spinning for almost three hours. Well, we're starting to see, again, the dichotomy again we are. Between, between truth and falsity. Truth and falsity goes to the very issue of who's been killed as a result of being in this. Uh, and then the other thing, the other thing you can do to discredit yourself is be in prison. Now, who among these, this constellation of people, some of whom we believe and some of whom we believe basically are government COINTELPRO operatives, who's been jailed? Well, let's see. We've dealt with the jailing of Mark Richards for a murder he said he didn't commit. So he may be innocently jailed, but certainly it's discrediting to be jailed for a murder. I'm speaking out now to avoid a false allegation because these false allegations of atrocities have been thrust at me. I want to – I deserve to be free of being charged, convicted, or imprisoned for any felony or misdemeanor because I've never committed one. OK, but those who have been jailed include Captain Mark Richards, Sean David Morton, and uh, James Casbolt. So that's kind of – suspicious that some of the major voices in the field would either end up dead with black goo supposedly oozing from their orifices or in jail. That certainly doesn't create a lot of public appeal about what the information that one's sharing. So I just want to cover, you know, both the sort of the Flash Gordons, synthetic experiencers, and then the super soldiers. Who's a super soldier in my view? How about William White Crow? You know? White Crow had the most impressive physique I have ever seen on somebody who has never used anabolic steroids. He had cannonball biceps in 1970 before bodybuilders were using steroids, or at least when they weren't readily available. And I've consulted with him on that, and he did not use steroids to develop um, physically. And he was a person who could suddenly take charge and throw weapons around the group and protect you from lethal assaults. I mean, he's a soldier's soldier. That's what a super soldier is. Not somebody who can't piss their way out of a paper bag who alleges that they're a super soldier. Yeah, I, I think we've kind of gone through pretty much the entire list of things we wanted to touch. Um, but you're definitely right about it. The, we have seen so much spinning and and creation of alternate realities and, and just... I, I think the people who hear these shows, you, you're going to have to decide for yourself. All we're doing is providing information that, that comes from a place of, of research and experience, and that, that's why we're, we're doing this. Andy... I'm trying to find a way to wrap this up that because we could go forever. I mean, it's 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 a it's a bottomless pit, and I mean that literally. Where do you want to leave it tonight? 
Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear and also to, to, to leave it at that, this note. And that is, look, I always had honorable purses, uh, purposes in coming forward. I wanted to share the true history of the development of time travel by the United States government in the early 1970s and the true natural history of our cosmos in affirming that our solar system is inhabited, which is to say that not only our planet Earth, but Mars at least is inhabited. I know because I've been there. I did so because I believe that the American people and the people of the world have as part of their common heritage as of humankind, as human beings, a right to know about the true technical history of our civilization and the true natural history of our cosmos. I think we have a, a basic human right to those two things. And I came forward at risk of my professional and personal reputation. And my professional reputation consisted of being admitted to the bar in a beautiful place to live, Washington State, with wonderful clients. I've had a great adventure practicing law at the, federal, at the state and then the federal level for the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington. I mean, I love what I do. I've been able to help hundreds of people. And I've always stuck to the truth. I've tried to avoid gossiping about others or, or imposing character judgments on them. But as my truth campaign ensued, as I think I've described tonight, inciting the different dishonorable things that were thrown at me, I went from people disagreeing with me and just saying, as a matter of rote measure, I don't believe you, you're not telling the truth, to accusing me of being a non-person or accusing me of committing atrocities involving murder and child rape and other odious things that I would never think of doing. So I have only come forward tonight against my own grain in the sense that I mentioned how when I was doing my Mars anomaly research more, more frequently, I found that every time I stopped to defend myself was another anomaly that I didn't discover in a NASA photograph. Isn't that in really other words, the point, though? I mean, isn't that the point of a lot of this? Yes, and, and uh, that, that, that's, I think, the note that I want to end on, and that is we only occupy a small, a small dit dot of universal time. We don't participate in everything that came before us and everything that will come after us. Life, as, as you start to learn, as you, as you grow older, is what scripture describes it as. Is, it's a vapor. It goes by very quickly. And so we have to be cautious about spending our time fighting between each other. But I, I, I felt compelled to – nonetheless, I felt compelled to come forward tonight because the response of the truth movement in the main – to my information and what I brought personally to the field was the worst kind of character assassination that can be attempted against a human being. I didn't deserve it, I don't own it, and I reject it outright. And so I wanted to do at least one show that said to all of these people who have defamed me and made hideous allegations against me, who have tried to dilute the accounts of true experiencers who have served our country heroically with the false accounts of posers to those who have manipulated language itself to confuse the public that we have won and they have lost and tonight at least it was time to name names and kick ass and take no prisoners and so I just thank you for letting me appear to discuss this tonight. And that, that we've done. Um, Emily, anything that you want to bring to the table before we close out? No, I, I think I'm good. And I uh, um, have enjoyed listening to, to you, Andy. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's important to name names and to uh, speak our truth. And uh, you did it very eloquently. And that's it. That's all I have for right now. All right. Very good. So we've done it. We've rolled up our sleeves. We've gotten a little dirty put a lot of stuff out there um you know you have to decide for yourself in the end you're a consumer of information be responsible about it to the providers of information you have a moral responsibility as we are aware that we do here as well and i think we've stepped out in the last few weeks and tried to do it without rancor without undue hostility to pre present something that will give pause to the truth community such as it is right now. You need to clean out your closets, you need to take out the trash, and we need to start to get this whole thing right. 
With that, we'll leave it for another show. I'm Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer, our guest Andrew Bishago, with us for nearly three hours. This is Off Planet Radio. The website is offplanetradio.com. The truth is out there, and it is inside of you. Good night. This is Off Planet Radio.